morning, thanks for coming. I didn't expect to see this many people here at this time, so thank you so much. Uh, I'm working right now in commercial archaeology as a consultant. So this project that I'm going to be talking about is out of that um, perspective. So it's a, a bit of geoarchaeological research done within the commercial perspective. Um, we are talking about an area that is in southern Alberta in Canada, which is, I, I work predominantly in uh, central and northern Alberta, but the site that we're going to be talking about is just south of Calgary, which if you remember was the site of the 1988 Winter Olympics. Some of you may remember that. So the site I'm talking about today is the FM Ranch Campsite, or EFPK1. That's the way we number them in Canada. And just to clear up a, a um, question that I got a couple days ago, I'm not actually talking about a ranch. It's not a historic site. It's, um, it's named after the landowner whose land it was, the site was re first recorded. <laughs> so it actually is a prehistoric or pre-contact an ancestral First Nations or Aboriginal site in Canada. So that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about a historic period. The site is located um, on the T2 Terrace along the Bow River, just south of Calgary. And some work on the River Terrace formations in 1980s determined that the T2 Terrace has developed sometime around 2,500, 2,000 years ago. <coughs> I'm going to be talking about two main areas of the, of the site. So the site is this whole terrace. We're talking about the north and the south predominantly. So here's a, an image from the north. So in this image we're standing on the edge of the terrace and we're looking towards the escarpment that um, rises uh, above the terrace and forms the upper valley margin. It's a till plain. And then in this photograph is the southern part and right now we're standing actually at the adjacent buffalo jump. So it's we're just standing about right here, and actually right here, and we're shooting, looking at the southern part of the site right there. So we're going to be talking about those two main areas. Before I get into bison jumps, <clears throat> I just want to say too that this project was arose out of um, the provincial funding, the government funding that was designed to help mitigate the results of a 2013 devastating flood that occurred in southern Alberta. The Bow River and its tributaries flooded and wiped out part of the Trans-Canada Highway near the Rocky Mountains and also flooded downtown Calgary. It did a lot of damage to uh, some of the smaller, rural, more rural settlements in the area as well. So in addition to all of that, it damaged and destroyed a lot of archaeological sites along the Bow River and along the tributaries. And so the government did a bit of rescue. They funded some rescue operations. Um, and some research because of this, this flooding. So they put out a request for proposals and we submitted our proposal and we were awarded the work and that's where this work is coming from. So as I mentioned, this is a, uh, um, a campsite but it's adjacent to a buffalo jump and I thought I would just introduce buffalo jumps or bison jumps to those of you who may not be as familiar with them. First of all, they're not really a jump. Probably no bison would actually run towards a cliff and jump right off to their death. But um, it's, they would probably fall more. But the, the gist of it is that we, it relies a lot on illusion. So this is the illusion that we have here, um, where you have a, a flat plane that overlooks another flat plane, but it's quite far down. So it looks like you're, you're heading in the right direction, and all of a sudden, boof, you're going to fall off the cliff. Um, what, that's one illusion. The other illusion is that you have a solid wall. So this is, this is what the, the ancestral First Nations used to funnel and drive these bison off of the edge of the cliff. So they used small rock cairns in this area and this, at this site. They used small rock cairns to stick um, shrubs or any kind of sticks to make their an illusion that there was a wall. Sometimes they would stand at those cairns and wave hides or other shrubs and whatnot. And this is what they're doing here. So the bison, who don't really have great eyesight, they, they, are, they are funneled in from hundreds of kilometers away sometimes with these cairns and they stampede off the edge of the cliff. And these bone beds are 
the results, like it's, it's the archaeological evidence that we have of these massive kills. So we have dozens of animals kills, killed all in one moment. So it's a big effort, but it's a big payoff. It requires a large amount of people to perform the drive, but also to process the kill in time that it doesn't spoil. So it's a community effort. It's a aggregates of small bands coming together to work to do this community hunting strategy. So it takes us to the FM Ranch campsite, uh, where we have it's a, it's a campsite associated with the buffalo jump, and it's an excellent preservation, or it has been excellent in excellent preservation. In this photograph here, we're standing at the southern part of the campsite and we're looking towards the buffalo jump. And this buffalo jump, this is all that really remains of it. So it's slumped and eroded into the river. Um, but that was the bone bed. And it's been very badly eroded over the years. There's been limited research excavations at, the, at this site, um, mostly in the 50s and 70s. And since then, it's been dominated by commercial investigations. What we, so what we know comes out mostly of those commercial investigations and those initial research excavations. So we know that there's multiple occupations at the site. There's few diagnostic artifacts, but the ones that we do have suggest that people occupied the area from about 1,300 years ago until about 200 years ago in the proto-historic period. The proto-historic period in this part of Canada is about 200 years ago, like I said. It's characterized by the appearance of trade goods in the area, but it's before Euro-Canadians came in and settled permanently. There's no chronometric dates before our work here, uh, other than a obsidian hydration date from the 70s from the bison jump uh, that came about 750 years ago and we have a lot of erosion and developmental pressure in this area. The landform is owned by a developer who is considering what to do with it. So the government wanted to know a little bit more about this site before it made some management decisions. So our archaeological problem is pretty basic. We don't really know very much about the site, so how do we manage it? We have a lack of understanding about the nature of it, the chronology, and the relationships between different areas of the site. It's about a kilometer long. And is it all one site? And how are the different occupations related? What do they, what age are they? And what, you know, the list goes on. This is the stratigraphy from the northern part of the site. This is the stratigraphy along the riverbank, the eroded riverbank at the southern part of the site, just to get you oriented. So the, the project goals are in two phases out of necessity. The original request for proposals, was, it was a pretty basic request, which is just to establish the stratigraphic framework for the site, because there hasn't been any systematic stratigraphy done for the site. And then they added in, um, you should take samples for radiocarbon dating in case we have money to do them. So that was pretty basic, phase one. <coughs> While we were conducting phase one, there was an opportunity to do some more work I saw, for to do more geoarchaeological work there. There was a number of exposed combustion features all along the eroded riverbank um, that were falling into the river. There was like seven or eight um, from different time periods, you can see. So um, I proposed that we do additional work, and so that's phase two, to look at these combustion features. So our phase one methods predominantly were field-based and pretty basic, like I said, focused on stratigraphy. Uh, we also did um, gradiometer survey to target some areas for excavation. We did handheld magnetic susceptibility measurements as indicators <coughs> of combustion and heating. We also performed uh, for portable OSL measurements or uh, using an OSL reader. And for some of you who are not familiar with portable OSL, just very quickly, it relies on the same principles as OSL data, but it's a rapid and quick and dirty reader uh, of the OSL signal of sediments. So you take sediments from the field, and it just does a raw, it provides the raw signal. So it's like an estimate of the stored OSL signal 
for, of the sediments, but without correcting for any of the variables that affect the signal, like color or water content, etc. So we did that, and I also did opportunic, the opportunistic sampling of the combustion features, just in case we got the money to do phase two. And we did get the money to do phase two. So those is, this um, is lab, more of a lab-based process. So we uh, focused on chronology and processes. We were able to submit four, six radiocarbon dates for analysis. I submitted bulk sediment analysis, and I'll be talking mostly about the total phosphorus as indicators of cultural inputs. We did some micromorphology, and these are the combustion features here along the bottom. Oops, I know I'm gonna do that. Along the bottom inside. This is uh, the control sample. Like I'm sure you noticed that the, the landform is cultivated, so it was unlikely that we were gonna find anything that was not impacted by humans in some way. And I didn't have a permit to go off-site any, anywhere either, and everywhere else is cultivated as well. So what I did was I sampled one of the buried soils that was not, it didn't have a ton of artifacts <coughs> in it. And so we have that soil and we have the uh, fluvial sediments on top of that in this thin section. And we also partnered with the Royal Alberta Museum who did some microfossil and paleoenvironmental analysis, as well as they did a survey of the modern vegetation of the area. So our results of the phase one was to construct detailed stratigraphies that integrated uh, all of our measurements and the OSL profile. So I took the field stratigraphy and then I made a schematic out of it. Um, by the, the regulatory requirement was that we excavate in 10 centimeter um, arbitrary levels. So I correlated the artifact recoveries from those with our stratigraphies. And then I started to delineate occupation zones. And those occupation zones had criteria being that it was on a floodplain. We couldn't just have a couple of little pieces of bone and say that that was an occupation layer. It had to be associated with the soil. It had to have a certain amount of bone, like more than 10, and preferably be associated with a feature of some sort or with other artifacts like lithics or fire cracked rock. And just, uh, we also, I also wanted to look at the depositional history and see if we could do relative <coughs> dating with the OSL profiler, which you can do sometimes. And ideally, you want to have a signal, this is an example from another site, we have, of course, the younger signals at the top, the smaller signals, and the larger signals at the bottom of the stratigraphy, and you have that gradual increase with depth. But, of course, at the FM Ranch, we didn't have that. It was a more complicated signal. And this wasn't unexpected because it is a fluvial landscape, and this is pretty typical for fluvial uh, deposits. So I was sort of expecting this. I was hoping for a different, but that's okay. If we just focus on this, these are other types of interpretations that you can make with the signal. If we just focus on this, this is the number of photon counts uh, up in the sediments down the profile. And you can see that there's a number of um, uh, inversions in the OSL signal as they go up the profile. And that was pretty much throughout all of the sediments that we looked at, or the profiles that we looked at. But I also noticed that there's in most of the profiles that we looked at, there's a pattern where the, the lower sediments have more inversions, there's more inversions in the sediments in the OSL signal than there are in the upper. And this is a pretty consistent pattern. So I used that as a marker horizon, and I looked at all of the profiles across the landform, and then I constructed a relative chronology using that. And so this is for my phase one report, which I had to submit before we did anything in phase two. I uh, had to submit some recommendations and we didn't have any radiocarbon gauges at that time. So I used the relative chronology to um, this is what the, all the different colors are here on the landform. I was, um, estimated the age of each of portion of the landform. So pretty much I said this area was the oldest and we have younger parts of the landform. I mean, that's kind of obvious, but it was something that hadn't been done before and the, the site had been treated as all one, um, all one age of occupation. 
So phase two, we did get our radiocarbon dates. And so um, we have in the southern part of the landform there, we have this exposed uh, stratigraphy and the lowest artifact bearing soil bone from there is about 900 BP. And our upper sampled layer is about 400 BP. In the northern part, we have a combustion feature with a lot of, uh, it's basically kind of an occupation floor, although not the floors like you guys were talking about. And so, oh, sorry. Is it okay? Oh, <laughs> is it fine? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, and it's about 1,200 years ago. And in the central part of the landform, it's about 1,300 at, at the oldest date that we had for that. Our bulk analyses, again, I, I recognize that we have a, a fertilized, cultivated landform, but I also recognize that some, we're going to get some blips, like some uh, elevated phosphorus levels in the buried soils and in the com in combustion features potentially, and we did. So we have in the brown, the brown arrows are soils, and the red arrows are the combustion features, and you can see the green squiggle is the this is the phosphorus, and we get elevated levels there. For micromorphology, I did the descriptions, and then I pulled out what, uh, what indicators I wanted to use for cultural events like burning or occupation or environmental processes such as stability or instability. And I'm not going to go over it because of time. Um, macrofossil analysis. Matthew, who did the analysis, he was quite disappointed that he couldn't um, find more seeds and other indicators of medicinal plants in the combustion features. Uh, he was hoping, like, this is his list of traditional um, pl plants used for traditional medicinal purposes and other purposes, but uh, basically he had, there was three kinopodium seeds in one of the features that could have been introduced naturally. So uh, he was disappointed with that, but he actually did really well with the, all of the other stuff that he had to deal with, which was wood and charcoal. Um, he pulled out microdebitage as in here. So he, he was able to actually get quite a little, lot of information out of the, out of the features. So our summary of our phase two analysis, which had the, was of the combustion features, that most uh, are in situ and, and that they were, they were constructed on uh, an existing land service but without really any preparation. They don't appear to have been intensively used and by that I mean that there was not an, a lot of artifacts introduced to them and the, uh, the, although the phosphorus levels were elevated and so were the magnetic susceptibility measurements, they weren't like off the charts, except for one, it was, it was quite high, but the rest of them were moderately raised. Most of them had wood as the primary fuel, but some had conifers and some had deciduous plants. Um, several of them actually had two cultural phases, and that's the photo on the right here. This is the, the skinniest little combustion feature that we had, and it didn't look like very much, but even in just the thin section without looking at it under the microscope, there's you can see there's a cultural layer there, there's a mostly sterile sands, and then we have another burn layer there. So we have actually more than one phase going on. We have one that has evidence of just being a secondary disposal. It's not an in situ, it's not an in situ like a feature. One of the features had bone and wood as fuel, and that's the one actually that had the highest phosphorus levels and the highest magnetic susceptibility measurements as well. And we have evidence of this one that um, it used conifers only and it had almost complete combustion of the material. So in conclusion, geoarchaeological work at this site resulted in the establishment of key stratigraphic frameworks and chronological frameworks for the site that can be used for any, in the future, for, with anybody doing any research or commercial work. And characterization of the combustion features demonstrates that there was considerable variability within the site with the combustion features and it suggests avenues for future work. The radiocarbon dates indicate and the stratigraphies indicate that the southern portion of the site 
seems to have only stabilized about 900 years ago, and that's when people started to use the, the bison jump as well. The, there's radiocarbon ages obtained from another another consulting company took the samples from the bison jump, but the, their age set is almost exactly what our age set is for this southern part of the site, so 900 years ago. The central portion had more numerous episodes of stability than oldest occupation of about 1300 years ago. The northern part is similar. so. If it was first occupied at 1,300 years ago, it's unlikely that activities in the northern part of the site are related to the buffalo jump at the, at the base, at the southern part of the site. However, there is a kill site here. If you remember, this is from the beginning that I, we looked at. There is a kill site at the base of this escarpment here that may be related, I think, to the occupation uh, in the northern part. So further work. It would be interesting, I think, to link our findings from the combustion features to ethnographic and oral histories about how people, um, how people processed kills at bison jumps. I have a broad understanding of it, what they were doing and how, you know, processing for hides, processing to dry meat and extract grease. But was there any meaning behind using conifers or deciduous or why would you use bone as a fuel, for example? Uh, we have to continue to challenge commercial archaeologists to connect stratigraphies, chronologies, and artifact recoveries uh, on the landscape. So thank you to everybody for coming. Thank you to the dig organizers and to all of my colleagues and collaborators.